Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on passive programming. My name is Lacey Ellenwood, and I am a consultant at the Mississippi Library Commission. In today's webinar, we will have an overview of passive programming with programming examples for children, teens, adults, and there will be topics worked in for families, along with information on the importance of accessibility for passive programs. Finally, you'll learn how MLC can help with kickstarting passive programs at your library. So what is passive programming? Passive programming encompasses a variety of types of programs that allow patrons to participate with minimal to no staff direction. It's typically an activity that runs itself and patrons can participate spontaneously. Passive programming can help promote the collection, related programs and services at your library. Although there is little staff direction involved, passive programs do require staff planning and monitoring. One of the benefits of passive library programs is that they appeal to a wide variety of individuals, from preschoolers to adults. This means that running passive library programs is a powerful go-to strategy for libraries, especially for our solo staffed libraries. Passive programs can also be customized for specific groups, interests, or events, such as National Donut Day, which is June 7th. Let's cover some of the reasons why we do passive programs and their benefits. Creative expression, developing a sense of belonging and identity, being listened to and taken seriously, Meaningful participation and achievement are all developmental needs that children and young adults can experience through passive programming. Specific activities can also boost literacy, numeracy, attention to detail, and introduce patrons to new information and cultures. All passive programs have skills building elements. You should be able to identify and articulate these as a way to justify to your library administrators why doing passive programming and statistics are important. Passive library programs have a positive impact even with limited budgets. Materials are often inexpensive, but can still inspire conversation and community involvement. Think post-its or sidewalk chalk. So to summarize, Passive programs create positive impact with limited budgets, they inspire community involvement, and reach different types of library patrons. Passive programs can be pop-up, lasting only a few hours, or they can be put out for longer, lasting a few weeks or even a month. They all still require planning and evaluation. Here is some guidance to help with planning your passive programs, but please follow your local library systems policies regarding program planning. Two weeks before the program, you'll wanna purchase supplies needed for the program, make signage and any instructions to leave out, and for craft programs, you'll want to complete a sample. The day of the program, you'll want to set the program up in a high traffic area, if specialty supplies are needed, make sure to set the program up close to a service desk. You'll want to put out your library newsletter and any other flyers for upcoming programs if space allows. You want to take every opportunity to highlight the other rad things that are going on at your library. During the program, if you leave it out for multiple days, you'll need to monitor supplies Keep a statistical count through how many supplies are consumed, and I would advise counting a few times to get an accurate number. Remember to take photos for social media and any library publications. And then after the program, submit any required reports or statistics that your library needs. So one of our biggest concerns and limitations is always space in our libraries. I visited a library that was so compact that they used the back of a closet door as a passive programming space. 
So I'm going to toss out a bunch of ideas for how to wedge passive programming into whatever space you've got. Naturally, if you have a table or a display area, you're already in great shape. Carts are also good whether they're rolling or stationary. A tiny bit of horizontal space can host a jar or a literature stand, while mobiles and garlands literally take up no floor space at all. Vertical spaces are also easy to use. Windows are particularly nice because they advertise to passersby the dynamic activities that are going on inside. Just don't let them stay unchanged for a long period of time. I know we've all driven past that school or business that has the same sad snowflakes taped up in their windows year round. And if you have no vertical space at all, the front of your desk is the space of last resort. So when you find a spot, you're going to want to stick with it because consistency builds engagement and keep your passive programs fresh. I recommend switching them out weekly. Now, for what you've really come to listen to, program ideas. Let's start with children's passive programs for early childhood and families. Many of the ideas that I talk about in this webinar can be adapted for various ages. So the first thing is paths and obstacle courses. You can set these up inside or outside of your library, make them long or short, and infuse them with literary references. Consider incorporating counting, the alphabet, or animals into your courses. Use colored masking tape or painter's tape to create a tape maze. This is a super simple way to get kids exploring the parts of the library they may have never seen before. An eye spy display. You utilize this by creating a bulletin board from old magazines, stickers, and leftover craft supplies. I know we all have those. Each week, you'll post a clue and kids can submit the answers for a prize. You could turn up the literacy element by giving clues that relate to letter sounds or rhymes. You can turn a front-facing window into an interactive display that families will love by utilizing an iSpy display. Bonus idea toddler play. Basically what this is, is transforming a simple table into a corner with bubbles, Play-Doh, egg shakers, scarves, and puzzles. This allows kids and parents to make new friends at the library. For families, consider putting up a favorite place in the state passive program. You can partner with your local tourism office to provide brochures, maps, guidebooks as part of the display titled something like, where's your favorite place in our state? Have patrons post pictures or sticky notes of their favorite places to visit and create a display of travel books related to your state. You could also put up a map for even more engagement. This activity can be modified for social media through utilizing polls and resharing. And one of my favorite passive programming ideas is something I've titled, Nana, what is that? So this requires you to clean out the back rooms and tech rooms of your library to show families outdated technologies like rotary phones, record players, tape players, VHS players, CD players, floppy disks. I'm sure there are many other things in your storage rooms that you could utilize. Set up the tech in a corner for people to discover and to touch. That's the important thing. Include a photo op for social media sharing. Have prompts for children to operate the devices. Maybe put out a phone book as well to have kids and adults look up phone numbers and get those tiny fingers dialing. Here are two examples from the previous slide for an obstacle course and an iSpy passive program. You have access to this slide deck in the description below. There are links to additional information that may be helpful for your programming needs. Once a week passive programs are a great best practice. They encourage encouragement with the library and invite our patrons to establish a library habit. 
it adds to their sense of ownership and mastery as well, especially with kids. When we see children tell their friends, it's Friday, do the quiz, that kid really owns their library. So the first program that we're going to talk about is a guess the book character. <clears throat> this is when you create silhouettes of well-known children's book characters like Frog and Toad, Amelia Bedelia, maybe Curious George, and you post them on a wall. Any kid who guesses who the character is could win a small prize, like a sticker or something, um, at the reference desk. And then I would advise leaving each character up for a week and post clues throughout the week to help kids engage with that program. There's also an opportunity for children to share book reviews. So you can hand out or leave out forms for kids to review a book and then post the reviews on the side of your desk, on a wall or a bulletin board. Alternatively, you can have children draw a picture about a book that they have read and put it up in the library so that other kids can check out their reviews and maybe also check out that book. Bonus idea, use writing prompts. Think, about putting up a writing prompt on a wall or a bulletin board that says what makes you angry or what scares you to encourage self-expression and the development of emotional intelligence while also supporting creative thinking and basic literary skills. And finally, the old hide something in the library. Um, one public library that I saw um, hid a Waldo from Where's Waldo in different spots every week with a different item of clothing on. Others that I've seen have hid photos of authors around the library. Perhaps it's the author whose birthday month it is. Um, or they can also be something unique to your area, like sweet potatoes, catfish, a school mascot, or even the state flower. When kids find the hidden item in the library, you invite them to tell you at the reference desk and again, reward them with a small prize like a sticker. Here are two more visuals of the suggested passive programs for children. Can you tell I'm really excited about the outdated technology exhibit and the silhouette book character display? I think passive programs can help librarians tap into what their teens are interested in because passive programs allow teens to engage with the library on their own terms. Here are a few ideas to engage teens using passive programming. March Madness. This is when you pit books against each other in a bracket and encourage patrons to vote on their favorites. As winners move on, the competition will get fiercer until one book wins the ultimate prize. Voting can be done online using social media, in person in the form of tally marks on the bracket itself, or any other way you choose. And don't just stick to books. Consider using movies and video game characters as well. A craft corner. The crafty teens may appreciate the stealth programming in the form of a coloring table with coloring sheets, rocks, and other forms of media to decorate. If you're looking to encourage more participation, create a bookmark design contest. Patrons can submit a drawing of their bookmark and the winner's bookmark would then be printed and given out to library patrons. This is a great way to increase teen involvement in your summer reading programs and other themes throughout the year. Don't know what to read next? Stick your hand in the book jar. Um, basically what this is is putting different themed books into a jar for teens to pick out and decide what to read next. It's really from the luck of the draw. And then continue to utilize your social media for teen passive programming. Consider using a hashtag three word book talk where teens use three words to describe a book that they've been reading recently. This can also be translated into an Instagram story as well. Another way to engage teens with social media passive programming could be for the library to share a writing prompt like share a four sentence romance story. 
Again, some examples of potential passive programs for teens, like a book suggestion jar that combines Reader's Advisory and passive programming. You can learn more about Reader's Advisory from a previous webinar from another library consultant at the Mississippi Library Commission, Shelley Ziegler. And then here is another example of a traditional style bracket for books. For adults, it's important to show that the library is more than just a quick errand to run when they need a new book. Here are a few passive programs for adults. Our old standby, games and puzzles. Your library can provide board games, puzzles, coloring sheets, mind benders, Sudoku, crossword puzzles, and other word games in the reading room. Adults that are waiting for children to find their books can sit down and relax, and patrons that are using the library for reading materials or internet access may take some time to unwind in a comfortable environment. Large print crosswords and word searches will make your passive program more accessible to various adults and pa other patrons. I also really like the bad art contest idea. So this is when you pull out the extra bits and pieces of craft materials that you have laying around and let your patrons create their best or worst art. I would work in a display of these items and a prize aspect for the best worst art. Um, you can utilize your social media for voting with this passive program as well. For families, Utilizing timely trivia is a way to engage with them. You can create a bulletin board titled, Did You Know? with questions about timely events such as the anniversary of the moon landing or the sinking of the Titanic. Um, you would post trivia questions about the event on the front of folded pieces of paper, keeping the answers on the inside of the fold so patrons have to lift the flap to see the answers. This is when it is time to bust out that laminator for more durability with your folded answers and other displays. Finally, passive programming can help build a sense of community. On a bulletin board, you can ask patrons what additions they would like to see in their community. Invite them to post their suggestions on sticky notes on that bulletin board. Um, and I would recommend sharing any popular ideas with your local chamber of commerce or city council, but be sure to speak with your library supervisor before reaching out to these stakeholders. Here are your visual examples of the programs mentioned previously. I've also been discussing accessibility with passive programs, but let's delve into that a little bit more. Passive programming gives us the opportunity to show all types of library patrons that they are seen and appreciated. English language learners, people with social and learning differences, Everyone can participate in passive programs. It's an invitation not just to express ourselves, but to learn about the community and to engage with others' responses. Remember, it's about creating an inclusive community. Sensory-friendly passive programs can serve neurodivergent patrons, such as those with ADHD, sensory integration disorder, and mental health issues. While planning sensory friendly programs, remember that some people are sensory seekers and crave stimulation, while others are sensory avoiders and prefer less sensory input. The accessibility of passive programs depends on the availability of options. A general rule of thumb is to provide multiple ways of completing activities at different levels of difficulty. A puzzle program should offer puzzles of different sizes with a varied complexity of pieces. For example, say you have a selection of puzzles, all with various car themes. Give patrons the option to choose between a 1000 piece puzzle of a race at Talladega Speedway, a 60 piece Model T car puzzle, a five piece wooden car cutout puzzle, and maybe an option to complete a car puzzle on a phone app. 
Another basic principle for passive programs is to provide descriptions for all items or objects displayed in an exhibit. During maker or craft activities, it is important to provide a variety of tools and to offer options at different levels of complexity for craft boxes, grab and goes, and coloring sheets. Passive programming can provide an avenue for those children, teens, and adults who need different strategies besides traditional programming to encourage reading. Remember those writing prompts that we mentioned earlier? Individuals with disabilities, including learning disabilities, will benefit greatly from passive programming techniques like those that improve reading and their writing skills at their own pace. I have hopefully mentioned ideas to get your creativity started, but put your passive programs into motion by borrowing tools from us at the Library Commission for free. Um, we have special collections that can assist you with trying something new. Here is a sample of our special offerings and a link to more of our special collections at the Mississippi Library Commission. I'll mention that we have Legos, we have a set of 15,000 regular Lego blocks and one set of approximately 450 Duplo blocks that are available to borrow separately. Each set has an eight week checkout period and can be mailed. So you could circulate this to different branches within your system for passive programming if you rotate it on a weekly basis. We also have board games galore. So you can borrow up to three games at a time to use at your game night or just to see how your community responds to board games. Some games like Boggle, Scrabble, and Jenga can be left out on tables for passive programming. We have a button maker, which is very popular for passive programming. The button makers are available for checkout and come with supplies to make round two and a quarter inch buttons. The button makers do need to be picked up. We cannot mail them. Um, and the button makers are available for a 12 week checkout period. You can contact Charlie Simpkins at the Library Commission for more information on our special collections. And his contact information can be found in the link for special collections on this slide. With your Mississippi Library Commission library card, you as a librarian can have access to Creative Bug, which is a database of video classes for arts and crafts projects, which also has a knit and crochet pattern library. Think of it like a streamlined version of those Pinterest craft videos you have encountered, but without the ads. You can demo activities yourself to see what will work for your patrons and then print out the instructions from Creative Bug to let your patrons engage. You just provide them with the supplies. I really loved this quote from the authors of the Passive Programming Playbook. Passive programming is gentle magic, establishing community by soliciting opinions, encouraging creativity, and making space for sharing. Creative expression is for all ages and all people, and passive programming offers an accessible path for our libraries to provide that need to our communities. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you have learned something to improve the programming possibilities at your local library. Have a wonderful day.